Welcome to the RedScope Virtual Workflow Series. Today, I'll be guiding you through my methods for analyzing scans across various clinical scenarios. I'll share with you my personal techniques to explore how to identify pathologies, discuss interpretation strategies, and examine different management pathways. So let's get started. This case is about a patient who presented with altered bowel habits. I have the previous imaging on the right side and the current imaging on the left side. So generally my approach for uh, CT scan and other cross-sectional imaging reporting is uh, looking at each and every organ separately. So I wouldn't normally scroll and just look at all the things in one go. I would look at one organ at a time. So in this case, as the patient has presented with altered bowel habits, I would start with bowel. Although um, it's entirely up to you, uh, sometimes it's better actually to not look at the suspected site of pathology first, because um, if you find a pathology there, then you might have what we call satisfaction of search. And in case you find a pathology there, you kind of can become a little bit careless about looking for any further pathology. So uh, that's up to you. Um, so let's start looking at the colon first. Okay, so this is the rectum. As we go up, this is the sigmoid takeoff and we can see the sigmoid. All right, do you see something here? What do you think about this part of the colon? Do you see a difference in the enhancement of the colonic wall in this area and the area below? I'll let you compare it with the rest of the colon. You see that there is a difference in the degree of enhancement. If you see carefully, I mean, there is a bit of a submucosal fatty change here, but you are still able to see the layers of the colon. As compared to here, where there is a bit of enhancement and the mucosa is so difficult to differentiate from submucosa. So that's that. Obviously, these appearances are suspicious. Just highlighting again this area of the colon I'm talking about. And what's happening in the rest of the sigmoid colon and the bowel. Well, like I said, we shouldn't have a satisfaction of search. So I will, for a time being, ignore this lesion and look at the rest of the bowel. Okay, so now I'm going up. This is the sigmoid colon. And uh, I'm not sure if you have noticed, it's slightly distended, isn't it? As compared to this part, which is essentially collapsed. But we can't really say that it's obstructed because we don't see any fluid levels. And I guess it's still within the uh, expected range. Um, okay, we're going here. This is also sigmoid colon. And then here it becomes descending colon. So I'll just follow it through. And then this is the splenic flexure. And now we have transverse colon over here. And we still don't find anything other than the abnormality in sigmoid colon. Now this is the hepatic flexure. And if I go further down, this is the ascending colon. And uh, this fat density thing, uh, when you start seeing and that's the ileocecal junction and below that would be the cecal pole and when you and then obviously this tubular thing is, is the appendix and um, um, you see this fat area this is fat density area that that's the indication where the ileocecal valves and from here you can obviously find the terminal ileum this is not a uh, study performed after bowel preparation so we can't really exclude any definite mucosal lesions but i mean grossly we don't have any definite other a big polyp or a uh, malignancy site the next thing is to look at the small bowel small bowel i generally start looking at it um, from the i start with the stomach the gastroesophageal junction stomach looks all right and this is our duodenal um, sorry pylorus duodenal bulb and then duodenum and as we go through, obviously, we look at all of these small bowel loops. I would normally not look at each and every loop individually, but I would try to scroll a couple of times to make sure that I haven't missed any definite small bowel lesion. Uh, let's look at the other organs. So, I mean, you can start in any way. I mean, I'm looking at the bladder first, and obviously it's partially distended. Well, you can see some calcification here bilaterally. Well, this is vas deferens calcification. Well, you can see vas deferens calcification in patients with diabetes. I'll look at the kidneys. Bilaterally, I don't see anything. Spleen looks all right. And then I'm going to look at liver very carefully because colonic malignancies do metastasize to liver quite often. I mean, this is, if you can see that there, there is an area which is slightly hyperdense 
in the left hepatic lobe. It's not too big. How big is it? Let's measure it. So it's about 0 0.9 centimeter or 9 millimeters. It's not too big, but there is something there, isn't it? I mean, it's not big enough for us to call it a definite metastasis, but I can't really call it anything definitely benign either. So what I'm going to do is I'll look at the rest of the liver to see if these, this abnormality is multiple or there is just this solitary lesion. So I don't see any other lesion in the liver. So that's reassuring. There is no ability dilatation. The portal vein looks all right. And um, I mean, th this is this is this is the only thing, isn't it? All right. Then I'll uh, look at pancreas, which looks fine, and the adrenal glands. So everything else, I guess, looks all right. But there is one very important thing that we still need to look at in my abdominal CT studies is the vessels. So we have this celiac trunk with its divisions. There is a bit of atherosclerotic change in the aorta. Then we have severe mesenteric artery and vein going side by side. We notice that the atherosclerotic changes have increased as we go down and they're even worse in the common iliac arteries. And you see this common iliac artery is quite thrombosed, isn't it? And uh, further down, I mean, it, it's only getting worse. All right, and then what's happening here? I mean, it looks like this patient had a, a some sort of procedure in the right groin and looking at the condition of the blood vessels. Also, you might have noticed there is something in the right external iliac artery. It's, it's a metallic stent. So this makes me think that this change is related to vascular intervention. And unfortunately, the superficial femoral artery on the right side is still thrombosed. Okay, so that's that. So what we have learned so far is the patient has got some abnormality in the sigmoid colon, which may explain their uh, altered bowel habits. And then the other important thing that we have concluded so far is that they have extensive background atherosclerotic disease and uh, it's uh, more severely affecting the lower limb vasculature. Okay, so after looking at that, next thing I'm going to do is look at the site of abnormality itself. So obviously, the altered bowel habits and this short segment of thickening and enhancement. My first concern is primary colonic cancer. We do have a range of uh, different differential diagnosis when we see thickening or stenosis um, structuring of the uh, colon, but that would be covered in a separate video. Uh, in this patient, given there is a short segment of uh, wall thickening and enhancement, the most likely diagnosis would be primary sigmoid colonic cancer. Now we need to stage it. Uh, we need to measure the area first of all to see how big is the segment which is involved. So I mean this is roughly the area which looks abnormal. It's about three centimeter more or less. So that's that. The next important thing to look for is the local spread of the tumor. So I mean if we just zoom this this looks like the tumor has involved the mucosa and submucosa and uh, it's very difficult to say with confidence that if the lesion has extended outside the colonic wall or not. I mean, they look like these thin strands going outside, but uh, you can't be too sure whether these are small vessels, some fibrotic response or the tumor itself. So, I mean, it, it would be safe to say in this patient that the disease is either T2 or early T3. The next important thing we need to look for is any local regional or distant lymph nodes. Well, there aren't any definite nodes here. There looks like a small lymph node over here. Let's measure how big it is. So it's 0 0.6 centimeter, which is quite small. But just to be sure, I think the best thing to do would be to look at the previous imaging. Oh, let me get rid of that. Okay, so I mean, this is a CT angiogram. That's why the window looks weird. Let me make the window better for this examination. Okay, so do we see this thing here? There is actually this thing here, isn't it? And there looks like a small node. So it was there previously as well. Well, this is not a very old study. And you can probably see the tumor was also there in the previous imaging as well, isn't it? Okay, so 
I don't think it's significantly different because this is not very old scan and I'm not sure maybe the abnormality was picked on this scan and then uh, now we have done the staging scan I'm not exactly sure I would have to look into it anyways looking at the size of this lymph node I, I don't think that's definitely malignant I'll give it a benefit of doubt and also considering the tumor is quite wall limited I'll for now consider it and not okay the next thing is to look for uh, uh, distant metastases which include both the visceral metastases and also non-regional lymph node deposits. So for uh, the sigmoid colonic tumor, the local regional lymph nodes would be in the sigmoid mesentery. And um, so we need to look for any retroperitoneal lymph nodes, paraiotic, aortocaval, the portahepatic lymph nodes, perigastric lymph nodes, everything looks clear. And also we need to look at the peritoneal reflections and any deposits in the omentum. And uh, I generally look at uh, paracolic gutters always, always when I'm trying to do loud peritoneal carcinomatosis because of the flow of the peritoneal fluid, you often see deposits hanging over here. All right, so we don't seem to have any disease other than this equivocal liver lesion in segment two. Let's look at the chest now. Okay, so in the chest, I would start with looking at the airway as well as esophagus. And, uh, well, the esophagus looks diffusely thick-walled, isn't it? I'm saying diffusely because I'm noticing that it is thick throughout its length, which makes me think that it's probably related to esophagitis. Um, okay. And there looks like a bit of submucosal edema as well, because you see there's a relatively low density within the submucosa. Okay. We don't see any definite mediastinal lymph nodes. We don't see any supraclavicular or axillary lymph nodes. The thyroid gland looks all right and uh, one very important thing is to look for PE. Whenever you're suspecting cancer, even if you're not suspecting cancer, it's always useful to look at the pulmonary tree. Now this is obviously not a dedicated uh, scan on PE protocol, but you can still look at the main pulmonary trunk and its uh, major right and left branches and they look all right. And obviously we can't exclude any small distal segmental subsegmental PE. Okay, that's that. And then uh, we need to look at the lung windows. So looking at the lungs, different people have different approach. I usually uh, look at one, one lobe at a time. So for instance, in this case, the scan is slightly blurred, isn't it? But still you can see that there are no definite nodules. Obviously there's a bit of peribronchial thickening, which is related to chronic airway disease, but we don't see any definite pluripulmonary nodules, there are no pleural effusions either. So last but not the least is the bones. We need to go to our bone window. I mean, that's up to you, whichever window you prefer. I usually keep on switching between these two windows. All the ribs are clear, scapulae, humerus, clavicle, sternum, everything looks clear. And uh, in the pelvis, Everything looks all right. And generally I look at the vertebral column separately because I can't really see all the things in one go. So I generally look at the vertebral column separate from rest of the bones. And then it's always useful to look at the sagittal and coronal reformats. Okay. So here we go. Wow, it looks, the spine looks very nice. Uh, no definite metastases. Okay, that's that. All right, so what have we decided so far? There's this short segment, three centimeter, highly suspected tumor of the sigmoid colon with no definite local regional lymph nodes and uh, a small sub-centimeter hypodensity in segment two, which could be benign, but we need to be sure about it uh, before we say that this is definitely M0. So what we're going to do is, first of all, first thing first, this patient will require um, colonoscopy and biopsy of this lesion for histological confirmation, and then an uh, MRI of the liver. And for suspected uh, metastases from colonic cancer, we uh, generally do primovist MRI. So that's what we're going to do. And after that, obviously, this patient also requires a discussion in MDD and uh, Depending upon the histology results, MR findings, the proper staging would be made and the treatment of the patient would commence. Thank you for joining me in this tutorial. 
If you found it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe for more content. For any questions or feedback, feel free to drop a comment below. Until next time, happy learning.